It's July 29th, 2021. This is Rook. It's no secret that Iranians like their plastic surgery and augmentation. Getting a nose job is tantamount to a national rite of passage after all. But how do we really feel about plastic surgery? And can it be something beyond just aspirational beauty and more about mental health, confidence and self-esteem? Well, Dr. Sheila Nazarian is an Iranian-American surgeon and she'd be the person to ask. She has become well known for her practice in Beverly Hills, her product lines, her inspirational talks and her Netflix series, Skin Decision before and after. Dr. Sheila Nazarian joins me for a feature interview today. Plus, we have your letters of the week. This is Conversations From, To, and About the Iranian Diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 131 of Rook. Hope you're keeping well. <laughs> you okay, Captain Reza? I am. I had sushi stuck in my throat. You, uh, listen, this Captain Reza, I don't understand this guy at all, Shia. You ordered food so that we get here five minutes before we were recording. <laughs> yes. I wasn't thinking. And then you're wolfing down your food. I mean, yes. it's, it's so obvious what's going to happen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Welcome. Let me try this again. Uh, welcome to episode 131 of Rook. Hope you're keeping well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada, where Olympic gold is weighed in whether you have subscribed to Rook. <laughs> And become a patron yet. You see that, Captain Reza? You see what I did there? I love what you did. Why go to Tokyo Mm -hmm. to compete in the Olympics when you can be gold by just becoming a patron of Rook? Simple as that. You see? Isn't that the truth? Please explain what I just said to Shia so he understands. (laughs) So the Olympics. No, no, no. Okay, no. (laughs) Uh, We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms and become a patron. Uh, We really appreciate your support. We uh, crowdsource this show. So if you're a regular listener, rookmedia.com, you press the support us button. And for five bucks or 10 bucks a month, uh, you support us. And we really appreciate that. We're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, CastBox. And if you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, see us on social media. You switch over to our YouTube channel or Instagram right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persian, check us out on Telegram. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sheila Nazarian, I, I'm tempted to say Sheila Nazarian, mm-hmm. uh-huh. but I think she says Sheila Nazarian, certainly yes. on Netflix. That's the more English way to say it. Um, you know, watching her Netflix series was an eye opener for me. I'm going to say this to her with transparency because plastic surgery is, I guess what I learned is not always or only about trying to attain some unrealistic version of societally determined beauty but um sometimes it can be really necessary or helpful or important to one's self-image and and self-confidence she talks about this a lot and you see someone who for example has been in a terrible accident or has some sort of reason why they want to get surgery done that changes their life and so it's not just about looking better on Instagram, but uh, right. um, but it raises a lot of issues, especially in our community. Persians are kind of known for liking their plastic surgery or getting their nose jobs. or, or And so um, I want to put those questions to her right. and find out. And she's got quite a story of fleeing Iran as a refugee, as a oh. Jewish Iranian kid and coming here. And, and now she's got this massive practice in Beverly Hills and, and uh, these product lines. And she was nominated for an Emmy Award at the daytime Emmys last week. Uh, We'll get to all of that. I'm looking forward to having Dr. Sheila Nazarian joining us from Los Angeles in just a few moments. Hello, Captain Reza. Officially, you've now 
now swallowed your sushi <laughs> and you're okay? I uh, have, you, I have. Safe and sound. Uh, hmm. <laughs> now let's see. There's a show coming up. I'll get some sushi five minutes before. <laughs> and uh, hello, Groovy Shai. Hi, Groovy Merci. Arum. Mizun? Not bad, yeah. Well, not yeah. bad, all right. Now, listen, Keon is not with... This Keon, uh, how many? How how long does the birthday celebration go on for, Captain Reza? Jesus Somebody explain Christ. this to me. I know. She's like on a birthday... Uh, what is it? Birthday week? She's on a yacht somewhere in the Caribbean. Dear Lord. And uh, the birthday, I think, was at, at least a two weeks ago. I don't know, you know. But she's still away. Yeah. Uh, getting away from the desperate winter cold here in Toronto. Right, in the middle of July. <laughs> at the end of July almost. It's, it's boiling hot in Toronto, but she needed to go down to the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah. But listen, she's having a great time. <laughs> Uh, I saw. I was seeing if I could get her on the phone. She's not even answering her phone because no. she had talked about maybe dialing in and you know saying yeah. hello from. She uh, certainly posts stories on Instagram. That's, that's right. Sure. That's right. She's out of touch, but somehow yeah. there's pictures of. Her, her reading her, on the beach or something. <laughs> yeah, and her yeah. latest book, she was like, oh, the wrong book to read on vacation because it talks about like the end of the world or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was like, oh, you, Keon, I'm so that jealous That Keon, right now. she's created a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot to make fun of uh, for the next few weeks. She's going to be getting a lot of <laughs> ribbing no from us, idea you know? What she's uh, walking into. <laughs> Just take it off and go into the Caribbean, <laughs> leaving us alone here. But listen, in her stead, uh, with the letters of the week later on today, Super P. Paris saw our mm. uh, one of our rook team members who's just come from Mashhad in the last few months. He arrived here and and That's is crazy. diligently working away here at Rook Media and is doing our translations. And uh, Super P will help us with the letters yeah. after uh, Doctor Sheila Nazarian. You know, we did get a, a bunch of mail. So on Monday we did an episode focusing on Khuzestan. That's right, and. Um, the situation there that is both a an environmental crisis uh, with respect to water and and resources, and then a human rights crisis because of course people are getting shot just for raising their voices to protest the fact that they don't have basic needs like water. Um, and we decided to dedicate an episode of Rook to that, uh, featuring um, Kaveh Madani, the scientist, the activist, writer. Um, and uh, Amir Tahiri, the famous uh, journalist, the, the guy who was actually the editor of Kahon back in the 1970s for almost a decade. Um, we called the episode Explaining Khuzestan. Uh, this, this episode has gotten a lot of traction. There are people um, on our podcast platforms. It's become one of our most popular episodes very quickly. I hope people will check it out if they haven't already, but we've gotten a lot of mail about it as well, and we will get to some of those letters. Uh, and obviously, this is not a situation that's going to evaporate anytime soon. So our thoughts are still with the folks in Khuzestan and all over Iran who are uh, experiencing this these water shortages. I listened back to the episode about Khuzestan, and um, I'm in awe with Dr. Mad- Dr. Kaveh Madani. Uh, but I, I remember the first time that we had him on the show. It was like if you know you. <laughs> from that minute one until the end you constantly learning something from him yeah. and I love not him. everybody agrees with him and we'll get to some of that in the letters but oh. he's a, such a super smart guy and he, you know he's so well positioned I mean as we explained on the episode on Monday he was talking about water bankruptcy he coined the term water yeah. bankruptcy yeah. with respect to Iran and other places in the world and you know two three years ago people were like this guy's a little over the top about his environmentalism he's an alarmist and now everything that he talked about is happening you know in terms of this dystopian uh, situation in, it, in it's Iraq. interesting that you say that the, there are people that don't agree with him have you got letters that yes. people post his opinion that's yes. interesting uh, yeah. well because he he i mean for example he says that the roots of this crisis go back years and in fact go back decades even before the revolution oh. uh, and then there are people mm. who prefer to think of this or believe that this mm. is only a result of the mm. uh, Islamic regime. So uh, that's maybe perhaps yeah. where there's a disagreement. Uh, you know, he's a nuanced guy. Very. And if you're if you're on any extreme in this debate, yeah. uh, you're not going to like, like the nuanced people, you know? So. But funny enough, uh, the, the, the feedback that I've gotten for this particular episode has been that this is one of the best segments ever produced on, on Khuzestan recently, like one of the best magazine that's coverage nice of it. Yeah. And uh, like my own uncle who didn't even know I was working on the show <laughs> and uh, I didn't your know uncle didn't know who you work on no he had no idea I was working on the show and did I had he no know you're a captain was... at least 
<laughs> does he know you? <laughs> not yeah. Does he know you? Does he recognize you? He yeah. has a vague idea of who I am. Yes. No, I'm joking. But and I didn't know he was a fan of uh, Rook at all. But then he messaged me. He, uh, like he, he, I think he found Rook and became a fan after through this because he was a fan of Kavi Madani. He shared the episode and then he nice. messaged me. He's like, I didn't know you were working on the show of Rook. And Gian is doing a new show. But I'm like, it's not quite new. <laughs> I mean, we've been on air for a year and a half. Yeah. But he said that. Uh, He's an engineer. Um, of course, he wouldn't engineer. know that because apparently you haven't told your family about our show. <laughs> go ahead. Yes. Yeah, Thank you, Reza. I don't you, talk Reza. about my projects that way. Begging people to become patrons. And Reza's like, eh, my uncle never heard of our show. You know, well, know, maybe I you know. could have told him. You've had a year. But I go know, ahead. Yeah, I yeah. did. I did. But, but I, I wanted to give him a sh- give a shout out to Bob Ack in Calgary and uh, right. for listening to the show being a being a patron I like the way you said Bob back in Calgary <laughs> Calgary <laughs> it wasn't Calgary but uh, it's, it's a, no, you I, got really shit on Z when you no, said I gotta Calgary. I gotta yeah. turn up the accent a little bit I got a bit of an accent All but right. I so shout out to your uncle Bob back that's right yeah right. for listening to the show does he go by Barry by any chance <laughs> <laughs> if you knew what his real name is what is his real name a boss oh yeah but it goes with Bob back what? Mm. When he came here, he started no, using... No, no, no. He was born. They, My uh, grandfather just went and got him a... Uh, named him Abbas mm-hmm. just because that was his father's name. Uh-huh. Came home. My grandmother got furious. She's like, I didn't know why I wanted to name him Bobak. You know what? From now on, I'm going to call him Bobak. I'm not going to let anyone... <laughs> okay, so, so he, he didn't Bobak. change his name. <laughs> no. Yeah. Here is Bobby. <laughs> He's Bobby. I thought yeah. Barry, Bobby, I figured Bobby, something. Yeah. 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 Bob in Calgary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob in Calgary. You know what Shia's real name is? Reza. Right. And he no. hates that name. He hates <laughs> it. <laughs> Goes by Shia. Oh my uh, God. I don't I, I don't hate that name, but definitely I prefer Shia than Reza. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's what most of our listeners say too. <laughs> 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 all right well, thanks folks i'm here all week <laughs> try the fish yeah uh listen uh are you guys caught up in uh are you watching the olympics at all uh i i, I listen to the coverage if, if you listen went, yeah on the radio okay yeah, on 680 news do you like are you following the canadian athletes or i the was iranian I was the or? female canadian athletes who won uh, team canada's doing pretty team well Canada's doing amazing actually. uh you know it's more fun than watching the euro and world cup if you're like iranian or canadian or even english <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we get somewhere you know <laughs> bejoy me you know bejoy so uh the, and you know the iranian team i think we've got a gold one goal and Kimi Alizadeh, of course, yeah. was, yeah. although can't compete for Iran. That was a historical game. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure if it's a game. It's a match. It's a yeah, match. match. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, a yeah. competition or yeah, something. Yes. Yeah. Um, fight, fight. The fight, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so so, Shire, are you watching the Olympics? Um, no, I'm just okay. yeah, I'm just following up the news and yeah. I like that you don't watch the Olympics. I want you to continue to be just an artsy guy, <laughs> you know, with your with like a long cigar. Uh, and a honestly, I wasn't a fan of Olympic. I, I, once actually, I watched the Iranian wrestling team mm-hmm. in Olympic, and they won the. I mean, That's what we win in. That's. A, Koshti, anything to do with fighting, jang, you know, <laughs> individual sport. Then you know, yeah. <laughs> I saw neither at all. Everybody's angry. <laughs> Could we maybe swim or do something else? <laughs> in that. That. Yeah. Um, hey, listen. In in you know, also, I mean, Khuzestan uh, was sad news. I tried to change the the tone with the Olympics, but uh, there was also sad news yesterday. I wanted to mention this. We don't often mention. Uh, we don't do a, a lot of obituaries here on on Rook. Uh, because it would take up you know most of the show there's a, there's a lot to deal with but um but just because it just happened and it was quite tragic uh Shahram Khashoggi yes. who was the uh the Iranian American I guess uh, um singer performer pop yes. artist um really sad he died let me get if I have the story right I mean a lot of people would know him I didn't know his music growing up, but I know in the the last twenty years he's had some hits like yes, uh, Nazi June. Nazi and, June yeah. um, he, if I have the story right, he was in Istanbul, mm-hmm. and he had to go to the hospital. And um, there's been suggestions that this was alcohol related, something to do with his liver. We don't know, but that's not why he died. He died because he got COVID, and he may have got COVID in the hospital. Yes, I mean it's just horrible 
right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was he living in Istanbul or it was uh, for work? And I, like it was I there? don't know. I oh, don't wow. Because he's American. I thought he'd be, be in LA, yeah. part of the Elaine pop scene. But And he is part of the, he was a part of the yeah, LA yeah. pop yes, scene, right? Yes, yes. Uh, did did mean, you ever meet him, Shia? No, no, but I, uh, I wasn't uh, his music fan, but I was really sad yesterday after I heard th- th- this, this news. First of all, I, 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 those people who have a hit song, I always respect. Respect, them. Yeah, 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 because it's it's not easy to have a hit song, you know. Yeah. That every people knows when you say like, "Doctor <laughs> Bandari," <laughs> yeah. so everybody yeah. knows that. So I, I respect them, and the fact that you know, he wa- he cannot perform. He couldn't perform for his real audience in Iran. So I assume. Even th- when uh, the fact that he di- he dies in Istanbul actually shows that f- for me it's a kind of symbolic thing that he wants to be close to the motherland, you know. And I, I'm, it, it's really sad. It's really sad. Hmm. Were you familiar with his music, uh, Reza? Well, as familiar as any Iranian would right. be, yeah. listen, like hearing it at events and uh, Arusis and stuff. But uh, he was very young, wasn't yeah. he? Was like 47. Oh, he was 47, mm. not even mm. 50. Mm. That's, that's very sad. Our <sighs> thoughts, uh, uh, sending out some love to the... Um, family and close friends and people who work with Shahram uh, Kashani, he will be missed. Uh, hey, in the coming days on Rook, Tara Tiba, Hamid Saidi, Ali Parsa, uh, the car guys, a special episode on Persians and cars with uh, Vahid Amin Mokadam and uh, Ali Bekhradi and uh, Roya Hakakion and lots more. But let's get to our future guest right now, yes? Yes. All right, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, we'll see you in a little bit with Super Patty Saw, and let's get to our future guest. You know, by any metrics, my future guest today is one of the most accomplished members of our global diaspora. Despite her relative youth, she is a successful doctor, a Netflix star, a massive social media influence. She's an Iranian-American board-certified plastic surgeon and the founder of Nazarian Plastic Surgery and Spa 26 in Beverly Hills, California. Dr. Sheila Nazarian is an award-winning surgeon, an entrepreneur, an activist, and a mother of three. She was a self-described awkward nerd as a kid when her family escaped to America as Persian Jews from Iran in the 1980s, but went on to become an academic success at Columbia, University of Southern California, and at USC's Marshall School of Business. Dr. Sheila is, you might say, a confidence maker who's on a mission, she says, to use her knowledge to help people feel good about themselves. You may have seen her on her show on Netflix, Skin Decision, Before and After, where she helps women and men who are struggling with physical or mental health issues or looking for important changes in their life. We will get to all of what that means, but I can tell you she was nominated for an Emmy Award for that program at the daytime Emmys that took place just last week. And right now, Dr. Sheila Nazarian joins me from Los Angeles, California today. Hello. Hello, that is the best radio voice I have ever heard. (laughs) I've got a face for radio coming from the plastic surgeon. Is that what you're telling me? (laughs) Sounds good. I was like, ooh, just keep talking. (laughs) Hey, listen, first and foremost, I got to say congrats on the Emmy nomination for your, your Netflix series. How did that feel? That was just like unreal and it's just so funny because I don't know what it is about me but I kind of um, envision things in my life and then slowly take like baby steps towards getting there. So, you know, before we got the show that was like the fourth um, pilot that I'd created and um, the third pilot was with E and I was totally devastated because I gave like a whole year of my life to creating that and they decided not to pick it up. Um, so then when this, um, but I met the producer on this one. So it was kind of like, you know, spreading that net wide and just making connections and then people thinking about you when new opportunities arise. So when we were pitching it, the first place we pitched a skin decision was Netflix. I stayed on the lot for 15 minutes after the meeting and just manifested. And I was like, I want to be with Netflix because when we moved into our new house, I didn't even know how to turn on the TV. All I knew how to do was push Netflix. So Netflix (laughs) is like all I watched. (laughs) So um, I was just like, this is it. Like I want to be on Netflix. It's in every country. Wait a second. Hang on. You, You stood in the lot and manifested? 
what I does did. what, did, what does that mean? Did. What does that? I, mean? I was just like, this is where I need to be. I was like, Netflix <laughs> is where I want to be. It's you told the universe. To you spoke to the universe. I, 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 I told the universe, and the same thing happened when we were filming it. We were like, Emmys, here we come. Emmy, Emmy, Emmy. You know, we're gonna get an Emmy. And so when you know, it's just sort of like putting that stuff out, working super hard, but also you know. I, I always tell people, you know, you don't you don't need to have like a clear goal. Like you don't need to know like specifics, but you should have like an idea of where you're headed. Because right. nothing's like, you know, if you wait until you have specifics, you're never going to do anything. You're just paralyzed. But I just feel like you need to kind of like know where you want to be. I knew I wanted to be on Netflix because that's all I watched. It was the only button <laughs> I knew how to press. So let me just establish, you're clearly not an A-type personality, right? You're <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I'm like the poster child for H. You're like a capital A type capital personality. Capital A, but I've yeah. gotten a lot better. I've gotten a lot better. I mean, one imagines that having a, a popular Netflix show, getting an Emmy nod, uh, is a game changer in terms of PR, in terms of public awareness, in terms of business. Has it been? It's been a typhoon. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. I mean, we when the show first launched. Um, you know, we were getting inundated, my staff with the phone calls, um, just they look like deer in headlights. So we actually had to get a call center um, in place very quickly just to be able to handle the call volume. I feel like the call volume has like settled down. But the beautiful thing now is that I don't have to like credential myself. Like when people call, I don't right. have to convince them why they should be coming to us. They already know they're coming to us. So that's been a huge game changer. So I can just focus the conversation and my staff can just focus the conversation on the procedure and what it could do and if they're a good candidate for it. Um, rather than being like, Dr. Nazarian is a board certified right. plastic surgeon. You know, like we don't have to do that part anymore. So that's been a relief. A bit sad that it takes a Netflix show to do that though, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just either that or it's just a, a long time in the right. community. Right. But, you know, now with the show and with Instagram, um, you know, 60% of my patients are flying in. Uh, they fly in from the country. They fly in from outside of the country. Um, you know, I have even like August, I'm taking it off to work on the entrepreneurship and to work on, you know, my e-commerce site. Um, I learned so much from quarantine last year that I got so much done. <laughs> during that two months that I couldn't operate or see patients that, you know, my, my the skin spot, which is our e-commerce sites kind of like curated skincare that's medical grade. It went up like 800% just cause I put my time into it. Right. So I was like, this quarantine thing is pretty cool. Like, you know, instead of doing two surgeries a day, let me do four surgeries a day right. and then just take August off to work on the skin <laughs> right. spot. So it was such a huge, learning experience that i'm just doing that the pandemic may not have been so cool doctor but i i it yeah, wasn't so. cool i wish people didn't suffer but i think there is you know a silver lining to everything absolutely and, you know, absolutely yeah, opportunity that was kind of like you know a growth moment for me and a huge you know learning moment there's so much i want to get to with you i i, I know so that many layers there, there are so many layers and i know that in the you know the persian community there's a lot of folks who are really proud of you i want to ask you about being persian i want to ask you about being jewish i want to ask about your story your business but let me first say you know Ever since we announced that you're coming on, there have been comments like, well, you guys do a show about the Iranian diaspora. It only makes sense that you're bringing a plastic surgeon on. I mean, there is this stereotype that Persians are somehow more into, um, I don't even know what you call it, augmentation for the sake of beauty than others are. Is that true in your experience or is that a stereotype? I think um, it's true in the younger generations. I think in the older generations, like everyone does their nose. I call it like the female circumcision. It's like at 16. <laughs> but they'll do their nose. But then, you know, a lot of the older Persian women are like, when they come in to see me, they're like, oh, I feel so guilty for being here. Why am, is this, this is like vain. I shouldn't be spending money on, my, on myself. I should be spending it on my children. So I hear that from like, the generation above me, uh, the generation, my, my generation and below is more like, you know, it's very important to sort of, you know, look good on the outside and feel good on the inside. There's a little bit more of a, and I don't know if it's because of Instagram or social media, but they don't feel as guilty taking care of themselves or doing preventative procedures. And I think that that's just like all around, um, not just in the Persian community. Um, I'll tell you in my practice, you know, I don't just see Persians at all. I would say maybe like my patient population is 3% Persian, maybe 5%. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Even uh, though you're in Beverly Hills and you're Persian yourself. Yeah. I just, um, I have so many, I think people flying in. Right. Um, 
and also maybe it's because I, you know, I'm known and maybe people are going to be like, oh, I don't want to see her at a party and like know that she's operating <laughs> on me. I mean, I definitely do, but um, I don't know. I, I think, I think I just get, I don't know. Maybe Wait a second. Why, why? Maybe my, maybe my, I don't know. I don't bargain. My prices are too high. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's, that, that might be true. <laughs> uh, but, but wait a second. Why wouldn't they want to see you at a party if you've been their surgeon? Is that, a, is that? I, I get that. Like if I see somebody at like a party, they won't even say hi to me because they don't want people to know that oh. they like, they'll be like, oh, well, how does she know her? <laughs> she probably got surgery. You know, so I've had people right, at parties right, that are right, my right, patients right. and they'll just like walk right past me <laughs> and not say hello. Wow. Um, which is totally totally fine i get that um yeah so i don't know and also i think um sometimes in my community you know i didn't get a lot of love i think you know you don't get a lot of love until you've kind of become a proven entity um and i got that not just from the persians but i got that from you know my colleagues they were like who does she think she is like one time i was at a persian wedding and when we were leaving like the actual like ceremony to go into the the party room somebody behind me was like oh well if it isn't our local celebrity you know, just like very patronizing. Right. And I have the account called the model surgeon, which is supposed to be a double entendre. Like the model is in like, you know, I, I did some modeling. Um, and the other side is like the model, like the example surgeon, like, right, uh, right. you know, right. and people like, I just would hear like, oh, who does she think she is? And like all of this stuff. So I think there was a lot of like, um, just like not wanting to support. Huh. I don't know. And then when the Netflix show hit, it was kind of like, oh, we're so proud of you. (laughs) Right, right. right. You know, and I'm a very, like, honest person. Like, I think, like, these are things that kind of need to be addressed in our community. Yes, yes. You know. Uh, um, I mean, I was going to say, I was going to say the good news is they'll never say it to your face, only behind your back. So. uh, Yeah, but it always gets back to me. (laughs) And I always know who those people are. That's the funny thing. Like, you might think you're talking to your friends that are on your side, but guess what? Some of them are loyal. And they might not speak up. Um, while you're speaking, but right. it always gets back to me, and I know who you are. I mean, in defense of our community, for the non-Iranians listening, uh, not not everybody is so horrible. You know, there is a no, no, there, are, there is all. loyality, there is love, but just like yeah. always been supportive, and but it's just like. I mean, I did a talk on this where it's like you know we're, our brains are hardwired to remember the negative. Yes. So if you're taking a test, yes. you only remember the things, the questions you didn't know. Yes. Like I know a lot of versions will come home and be like, Oh, I got, I failed it. And then you get like an A. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's so, yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, you remember those things and then you try to use them as fuel. You know, you're like, I'm going to do this. Especially those of us in the diaspora. Like, you know, we've grown up. I've talked about this a lot on the show. You know, our parents, you know, my my dad's mantra was to please work harder. Nothing was ever good enough. You know, it's like we're aspiring to, towards something that we couldn't possibly reach, you know. So we have that kind of uh, first generation, second generation immigrant pressure too, right? Exactly. Absolutely. And I think that kind of drove me for a very long time, like proving people wrong, I think drove me probably until I like the age of like 34. And then at some point you realize like, wait, everything I set out to do, I did. And I don't, and I can't live for other people. Like when you're, when you're living to prove other people wrong, you're not really living for yourself. You're living to show other people. And that's not really healthy. I think it's a huge fire and I think it's great like motivation. But at some point you have to let all that go and be like, I'm living for myself now. Like I'm going to make choices that improve the quality of life for myself, my employees, my children, my husband, my family, and I'm going to do it for me now. And I think it took me 30, 35 years to get to that point. Why age 34? What happened? I mean, I graduated residency. I got board certified. You know, we slowly started to like build our lives, you know, get more successful in our practices. You know, the show, the, you know, shows were coming. I was on TV a lot doing interviews and uh, being kind of like the expert uh, on plastic surgery. And then, you know, you just kind of like look around and you're like, wait, like check this. Like I had a family. People told me I wouldn't be able to, if I became a surgeon mm. check um, people, you know, it was very difficult. I'm not going to lie. It was very difficult to get married because it's very intimidating for, a, to marry a non-surgeon. See, I've heard you say Even this. If- I've heard you say this on interviews and I don't get it. Why would, I, cause to me, that would be like a, I mean, you would think this would be a huge selling point. You're doctor, you know, like, I mean, uh, no, I think like it sounds really good, but then when you think about it logistically, like I don't cook dinner. Oh. I need help picking up the kids. Oh. 
you know, I drop them off. I try to drop them off or pick them up one of those two every single day, but I'm not that wife that's sitting at home so that when you come home, I have dinner ready for you. And like, you know, the bath has been run for you to soak your feet. Like, (laughs) you know, so I think logistically it is difficult, but I think um, it also takes a really strong man to be like, I'm going to support you in your success. And one thing my husband said to me, I always say this is like the nicest thing. He said, I, your success is my success. You know, and a lot of Persian men, let's be honest, is and a lot of men in general, they they want to be the, you know, alpha male, yeah. like, and he is an alpha male. He's a brain surgeon. He's right, not not right. an alpha male. But to to say, you know what, you go, you go kick ass and you go live your dreams is very difficult for some men. Yeah, I don't understand that that part of our. Uh, You're the only uh, one. No, I'm not. I, I think there's a lot of guys. Uh, maybe it's a generational thing that who do, who don't understand. It is. That, I think it might the, be yeah. the old Qayrati or whatever it's the the Persian. Although you did find yourself a surgeon, so you've checked yeah. off your own Persian uh, checklist. You know, like you're supposed to either. Um, uh, marry a doctor or be a doctor or yeah. both and you've done both so you know you for those of us who aren't doctors we we always sort of uh, feel inadequate so we have the imposter yeah. syndrome next to you uh, you mentioned um nose jobs before i leave being persian and and iran you, you mentioned nose jobs and and you know iran is the rhinoplasty epicenter of the world and and yeah. it's become so the norm and sometimes i i I really have some heartache about that because I think, what does that say about us? Now, I know we're going to get into plastic surgery and and what it actually means for people's self-esteem and all of that. I don't want to dismiss what you do, but when an entire population, I mean, the, the, the percentages are well over 90% of women in Iran who get nose jobs, apparently, um, when an entire population feels that they need to change their nose, what does that say about us? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't think, you know, I actually stopped doing noses about um, five years ago. I just don't enjoy doing them. You spend so much time, you know, architecturally recreating something. And then at a year, it's like the cartilage just does its own thing. And it's like, it wants to kind of like go back to its you know memory of where it was before. And so that was just very frustrating. I feel like breasts, you know, when they settle, they just look more natural. They just look more beautiful. So Um, I actually stopped doing them, but I think, you know, if you're having like, obviously outside of like breathing problems and stuff like that, I think we really do need to kind of take back our ethnicity. You know, a lot of these noses in Iran, some of them are beautifully done, but some of them look like witch noses. And I don't understand (laughs) why that's, why that's a thing. Like I'm all about natural results and things looking like they were God given, even if, you know, I had a little hand in it with the, with the grace of God. Um, but I just don't understand these like trends. I've never been a trends person. I'm always like a very proportion, harmonious, not looking like you've had anything done. If, if somebody comes to you and says, oh, did you get this done? I failed. Oh. So a lot of the noses I'm seeing coming out of Iran, again, some of the surgeons are doing it like some of the best rhinoplasty surgeons. But I just don't like that like swooped, you know, nose with the really small tip and it looks like a witch nose. I don't understand that. Um, Also, I think in Iran, it's become kind of like a status symbol. Um, You know, people will literally walk around the streets with the cast on their nose bragging that I've I've even heard that they walk around with the cast on their nose, even if they haven't had surgery, because it's almost like a status symbol. Whereas here in LA, you're like in hiding for like, you know, two weeks till the cast comes off. But um, I think that's another thing to maybe address. Um, It's maybe, you know, also about kind of like I'm wealthy enough to do this for myself. Maybe that's another Actually, Abbas Milani told me that, that it's, that's heartbreaking that there's working class or, or young women and girls who don't have as much money, don't have the means, don't have the resources, walking around in Tehran with bandages on their nose so that uh, people will think that they had rhinoplasty, you know, as, as, as yeah. some sort of form of status, which is, it, it's so twisted in terms of how we got to that point. But, you know, in terms of what you just said, it makes me think, so, so do you care why i mean you're running a business clearly do you care what the reason is somebody wants to get something done in in other words oh absolutely you do it I makes a difference so to funny. You. people always think they're interviewing me but i'm actually interviewing you so the question that i keep asking is this person smiling 
Are they capable of happiness? Are they ready to receive happiness? And I ha we have all these questions on our questionnaire, like, is anyone um, forcing you to do this? Did anybody say anything to you that's making you want to do this now? And I'll tell you the other thing too, is like, I'm constantly projecting confidence and um, intelligence and re being reasonable and very even keeled with the show, with my social media. And so that tends to be the kind of person, men, men and women, that I attract. They're very well like established. They're mentally stable and they just need help with this one little thing that's been bothering them and they just want, want to optimize in every way. That's right. kind of my right. patient. So when I get, and I have some influencers um, that are, you know, under so much anxiety, so much stress, because they're constantly being looked at in every angle and everything that they do, and right. it's their job, that I have to kind of shift into mom mode and tell them, you don't need this. We, we're not doing that today. No, you're not doing that. You're not going to go down the street and do that. You're not going to do it here either. Right. Here, here's like, let's get a facial. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, because I, I know if I do something to make them look unnatural or if they say i want bigger lips and they don't need bigger right, lips and right. i do it they're a walking billboard for me that makes me look bad right. so i'm always you know i always tell people i'm not hungry i have a roof over my head i have my my three meals a day i'm fine i don't need to be doing unnecessary things and i think um that that kind of like moral compass has served me very well but um, but you know we talk about plastic surgery even i mean even just talking about it sometimes is is in a pejorative or dismissive way oh she's had work done somebody will say something like that well that's why and, we did the show right so you know that's why this show like i was already successful before the show came out i had a lot to lose actually whereas reality tv stars like that is their job and the more insane and the more you know circus like and dramatic they are right, the better it is right. for them because uh, the show will get renewed and they'll continue to have a paycheck right, i already right. had a paycheck so this show could have helped me, but it really could have hurt me too. So, you know, I really picked the patients um, in such a way, like we had, we had these people apply that were like, oh my God, I have a twin sister and her breasts are like more pretty than mine. I mean, no, that's not the patient I wanted for this show. Our show was, you know, the so, real so, so hang on a second, people. hang on a second. Give us a, an example for people who haven't seen the show. Uh, give us an example. I mean, cause one of your, your mission statements that you often talk about is improving, you know, that plastic surgery can improve quality of life yeah. so give us a, a brief classic example of of quality of life how that has helped been i mean helped. it could really be anything like we had a massive weight loss patient on the show that just had hanging skin everywhere hadn't had sex with her husband in two years and would run up to her closet close the door to change into her pajamas every night so he wouldn't see her naked that's one example another example of a woman on the show her husband shot her nine times killed their children, then yeah. killed himself. And she was walking around with all these bullet wounds all over her body. So removing those, you know, but it doesn't have to be that kind of story. It could be acne scarring. It could be, you know, I had quadruplets, I had children. And, you know, there was this woman who was a dancer on the show yeah. and she had to wear like two compression garments just to hold her abdomen in, even though she was like this big and weighed like 90 pounds. Yeah. It was like her entire abdominal muscles had like blown apart and it was it looked like she had like a, she was still pregnant and she's a dancer like on cruise ships. I have to tell you that watching Skin Decision, uh, I, I say this with some trepidation. I mean, it was a revelation for me in the sense that I think I brought some of my own stereotypes or prejudices to it. I was sort of thinking, okay, well, I've got to do the research to find out about Dr. Sheila. But 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 I mean, what do I? You know, I'm going to have to watch a Beverly Hills plastic surgery show. What is it? And and it's really inspiring in terms of the way it makes people feel to have the surgery they come to you for. And there was something that really struck me. They come out. I mean, there's this confidence factor, but some. Somebody said something like, this is the first time I have felt like myself. And I thought this is quite a remarkable thing to say, i.e. someone feels more themselves after having after altering something their body or their features whatever um than they did before that. Can you can you reflect on that cuz I'm I'm sure you've marinated on it before. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, that again, that was the show. And I've had my colleagues from all over the country message me and said, I had two patients today that walked in after they saw your show and felt like it gave them the permission to take care of themselves. So if you have someone who, let's say they're 50 years old and they have a huge waddle neck, their skin is literally melting off of their skull 
and they're very youthful and they want to travel, but they look tired and they look old, but they don't feel tired and they don't feel old. They want to be active and they want to be social. So helping them remove that helps them feel more like themselves on the inside. And there's certain things I always say, there's no exercise for the skin. You you can't exercise your breasts back up. You can't exercise the, you know, the the stretch marks off. You, You know, there's these, these people are actually like very active. And when you look in the mirror and this has been studied, when you look in the mirror and you look tired and you look depressed, it makes you sad. But if you look in the mirror and you don't look those things, it actually makes you happy. So imagine you took someone that feels in general sad and you made them happy. Like hmm. there's ripple effects on everyone they come into contact with, whether that's a mom and their, her children and her husband, whether that's a career person that's now speaking with more confidence on stage and is able to inspire people. So it's not just like you're affecting that one person, you're affecting everybody that person comes into contact with. And if somebody's listening right now and going, must be nice if you could afford it, what do you say to them? Um, it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. Right, right. And it's something we don't really talk about, but it is, you know, and we have to kind of be responsible in that way as surgeons and say, you know what, not everyone can afford this. What can they do? So that's why I started the Skin Spot, my e-commerce site, because there is stuff that's more affordable that you could be doing at home. Is it going to get you the result as quickly? No, but it will get you better. And it's at least it's not like 1999 crap that you're buying at Rite Aid. (laughs) That's going to do nothing. You might as well take that $20 bill and flush it down the toilet. Let me give you an option that might cost $50, but it actually works. You know, so that's kind of why I started that to begin with. And now it's kind of taken off because of the quarantine. Everybody was like, oh, my God, I've been, you know, doing taking care of myself for so long. Everything's shut down. What do I do? How do I upkeep? And so that's why the skin spot kind of like came to the rescue and filled that need and was like, this is a device that's a at home device at a fraction of the cost of what it would cost you to do it in the office. And it will improve you. Is it going to improve you as quickly? It's kind of like what I say. It's kind of like working out at home versus working out with a trainer. So the trainer is going to push you hard and you're going to get faster results if you can afford a trainer, but that doesn't mean working out by yourself doesn't do anything. So, you know, we kind of like have to give people options that work um, so that they don't have to go do things that might smell good or the packaging's good, or maybe their favorite influencer was getting paid to say it works, but it really doesn't. So it's kind of like taking my MD and my credibility and giving people things that can work at home. But it's true. Coming to the office is expensive and not everyone can afford that. When when people are coming in for, um, let's say for, uh, to amplify their beauty, not, not, not to fix a gunshot wound or, or, um, or even stretch marks but something that's mm-hmm. that's more what we talked about in terms of say the nose jobs. I mean you've yeah. said you've said everyone I want to quote you here everyone has something about themselves that they don't like physically. My goal is for them to look in the mirror and feel good about themselves. So how how do you fuse that beautiful message with an equally important notion that is, I think, thankfully prevalent these days amongst, you know, more so than when we were young or when I was young, which is love who you are, celebrate yourself and your uniqueness. You don't have to change to satisfy what society expects you to look like or some societally mandated idea of beauty. I mean, you have kids. How are you good? How do you walk that line? I think it's all about the intention behind the procedure. So I think if you're trying to do something to save your marriage or if you're trying to do something, you know, so it might just be, you know, I've had women come in that at the age of, you know, 35 are looking for like a little mini lift, but they also have 10 million followers on Instagram and that's their job and that is their income. And that's what put the roof over the head and puts the food on their table. So it's almost like, for me, I'm, I'm a, almost like the gatekeeper. And I have to, again, ask those questions. What is this? What is the motivation behind this? And is it a healthy motivation? I can't judge them on their age because it doesn't really matter. Um, I've had a 14 year old, for example, that came in for a labiaplasty, but she had one normal labia and she had one labia that was four inches long falling out of her bathing suit at the YMCA. And her pediatrician told her it was normal. So I'm walking in. All I know is it's a 14-year-old coming in for a labiaplasty, which is basically vaginal rejuvenation. 
at the age of 14. So I'm ready to walk in and be like, what are you thinking? And I'm, I'm ready to like give a talk to the mom. Like, are you crazy? But then when you actually look at it, you're like, holy crap, like this girl has to go to high school, get changed. And she has a labia that's four inches long hanging down her leg. I can fix it in 15 minutes and it's totally safe, awake. She doesn't have to be asleep. And then she goes on to college and high school with confidence. And I mean, so do you know what I mean? We can't put our own prejudices, right. ageism, right. and judgment on people who, in general, these days with the internet, are so well educated. Right. And, you know, kind of, you know, and then and the people I attract are not crazy. Right. So I've learned to kind of walk into every room with an open mind, hear everyone's story. And then I'll be, I'll say, you know what, I can help you or no, I don't think you are ready in the right mindset for help right now. Why don't you go see a therapist or why don't you go lose 20 pounds or why don't you, you know, I tell them what they need because at the end, ultimately, if they get, I want happy patients, great reviews and a fantastic looking result because that's what grows your practice. Right, right. Yeah, you know? you're, you're so right. I mean, even when it comes to um, breast augmentation, like uh, uh, that, people sometimes have a derisive attitude about fake breasts, you know. And I always think about this. I, I had a dear, I have have a dear friend who who got that surgery done, and it really changed her life. I mean, she, the, her confidence, she just, you know, just something that she needed to do to feel great about herself. And and why would anyone want to deny that in in someone? Yeah, right? as long as it's you know safe. Um, and you're in good health and you're doing it for the right reasons. Now I'm known as the small breast queen, like my hashtag is SBQ. Yes. So I'm known for putting in the smallest breast implants possible because I just think like it's for proportion and I've attracted by putting out that message, I've attracted very fit young women. So if you look at like my breast augmentation before and afters, they all have a six pack. It's pretty crazy. And they're all looking for like a B cup because they're just flat because they have zero body fat so they're looking they are not looking to be that pamela anderson look they're not looking to be top heavy they just want to have a breast a b cup maybe a small c you know so that again it has just been such a great marketing tool for me because all my patients look freaking fantastic after their breast augmentation because they walked in with like a six pack, <laughs> right. right? So so it's like that just niching myself into that small breast category, whereas every other like, you know, consultation they've been on have been telling them like, go bigger, go bigger. And they're like, but no, I don't want big. I just want like a B cup, <laughs> you know? So niching myself has been such a huge benefit at the end of your bio, you, on your website, you say, after all, plastic surgeon must be a sound doctor first. What, what, what does it mean to you to be a sound doctor? I mean, I think it's doing it for the right reasons, mm. right? I mean, people walk in all the time. Like I had somebody walk in and say, I want you to chop my earlobes off. I hate my earlobes. Can you just take them off? I'm like, no, <laughs> like, what you, you know, but there's always a doctor that you will find that will do some, some crazy thing. That to me is not sound. So, and then the other thing too, is a lot of people before I kind of, you know, established myself were like, oh, she's just getting patients because she's, you know, on Instagram or something like that. Well, it's like, if I was a crappy doctor, I don't care how good my Instagram mm. is, you know, word would get out eventually that like, I'm not a good doctor. But, you know, I always say you have to be a sound physician, an outstanding surgeon first, then go out and advocate for yourself, then go out and tell the world because nobody advocates for you, especially as a woman. You know, this is not a test that you could just put your head down and get an A+. Plus. Once you're out of that, like, testing and, you know, you've passed your boards, you really have to stand up and say, this is what I'm good at. And when I, when I mentor other women, you know, I have a nonprofit, um, when I mentor men and women, I let them know, like, you know, you have to stand up and tell people what you're good at. And the way you can swallow that so you don't feel narcissistic is to just tell yourself, if I don't tell people what I'm good at, how will they know they can come to me for help? So you have to tell people what you're good at so that you can help them. You also live it to a certain extent. I mean, you try a bunch of these procedures yourself. Like I, I, I watched you do doing cool sculpting on your lower back and, and waist area. It's called cool sculpting, and I'm not calling yeah. it cool sculpting. But it, yeah. but uh, is that to give your patients peace of, of mind that you're not doing anything you wouldn't do to yourself, or is that something to give you experience and peace of mind for yourself? Both. 
So what we do is we get a lot of devices sent to us and we'll try them on ourselves to, to A, check for efficacy. Because, you know, the companies talk a big game because they're trying to sell the device. And if I post it, I'm sure they'll sell more. So we kind of get them in. We try them on ourselves, see how it feels like, how painful is it? What was the downtime? Did it work? Then if we like the device, we'll keep it. And then when I'm speaking to people, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I've done it myself. And with the Persian community, one of the first things I ever did, and I was the first doctors to do, was just, like, inject myself with Botox. Because there was these rumors running around that, like, oh, this girl got Botox and she was in the ICU and her whole body was paralyzed. Or, like, you'll die. You know, it's snake poison, which it's not. It comes from honey. So... So these, I just started injecting myself. So A, people in my community would see that it's safe and B, that you don't have to look fake. Like I inject myself with filler. You know, I always have, I always tell people I have 13 to 15 syringes of filler in my face at all times, but it doesn't have to look fake. It can just make you look lifted and healthy and not sagging because uh, we all lose volume as we age. Same with skincare. I try every skincare product myself. You should see my skincare. <laughs> I have like... 500 pieces of skincare that I'm trying constantly to see if it, I like it, if it works, what does it feel like? How is it different? How is it beneficial? So I think that that served me really well because I kind of am my own ideal client. Um, I am the person that I'd want to attract as a patient. So if I know I like it, I know my patients will like it. And uh, also if they see me using it and I don't look crazy and I'm not dead, then you know they'll come in sure. and, and try it out too. Sure. I want to ask you about your your childhood, but just just before I do that, you mentioned Instagram, and uh, you're I mean so popular on Instagram. You you get the game. You understand social media. How do you feel about social media selling images of of I guess unnatural bodies or unnatural beauty? I mean, Instagram in particular. Sometimes I look at things and think. I don't even know what I'm looking at. What is this? Like like butts that you you know you couldn't have gotten from doing squats, you know? Is it is it hard for you because on the one hand, uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but on the other hand it'd be good business for you to for these kind of ideas to be out there. I mean, what what is your relationship with those kind of social media images? So, I always tell people social media is like a magazine. Right. We used to look at magazines when we were younger. Nobody buys a magazine anymore. You go on social media and you scroll. Right. So these are images that are photoshopped. They're images that people have had body modifications. And I call it out. I want people to know the truth. I like and, you know, if we ever do do another show, I am going to call it out. I'm going to bring in the influencers. I'm going to actually have them show us how they find like they, they face tune themselves and they make themselves look away like they make their hips look bigger, their waist look smaller. I'm going to actually like put that out there. Um, I think also like just put it. I always tell people like if you don't have hip dips, that means you did something, whether that's a surgery, injections or, um, you know, Facetune. Hmm. Everyone has a hip dip. There is no way to well, fill sorry, in. Sorry, what's hip a hip dip? A hip dip is like, you know, those little indentations on the side of your butt. Oh, so okay. So people right, that right, right. have like this. Right, right, right. Did something. The nat there is oh. no muscle there. There's no way to fill in a hip dip. There's no muscle there. I don't care how many squats you do. So I always, I put that out there and I talk about it on my Instagram because I think it's fine to, you know, make yourself look, you know, the, the ideal way and in a proportional way if you're coming to me, because I won't do it if I think it's psychotic. Um, but I think it's okay to, you know, do surgeries and do things as long as you're healthy and it's safe. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's unhealthy to say, look at how many squats I'm doing every day. And this is what my butt looks like when I can look at you and be like, that's not from squats, babe. Like, let's be <laughs> real here. <laughs> Right, right. So uh, you've got to, I mean, there's got to be people coming in sometimes who have a, a picture of something and go, I want this. And you, you just go, I, there's no chance I could do that for you. There's, I, so I can't, again, I, just to speak to my practice, which is not normal. I have never had anyone bring in a picture of somebody else. Oh, that's Everybody in my practice just wants to look like themselves, but optimized and lifted and refreshed and youthful huh. and healthy. I've never had someone bring in a picture of a celebrity or anybody um, because or that's a body just not type or something there. or like not a body type. I want to look like this. I want to nothing. No, no. Hmm. I guess I'll put away my Brad Pitt photos. I was going to bring to you and say, <laughs> <laughs> can you do this to my face? Uh, <laughs> can you make, can you possibly make this nose look like Brad Pitt's nose? Uh, uh, take, take, take us back to Iran. You know, it's your, 
your success um, means even, I think, a lot more when people hear the story. I mean, of, of how you, I mean, literally how you got here. Strangely enough, you were born in New York, but then you were immediately taken back to Iran just in time for revolution. Yes, <laughs> it's like, timing. let's go back. Yeah. In 1979. So how, first of all, how do we make sense of that? So my mom, I think, kind of uh, knew that something was brewing, but we had, you know, my grandparents in Iran, so it's not like we could just like leave and, and leave them by themselves. So they actually, she actually came to New York when she was nine months pregnant just to have me be a citizen, like an anchor baby, and then went back to Iran, 1979, revolution started, and they didn't let Jews leave the country, which is so odd to me because it's like, you don't like us. Let's but stay. you won't let us right, leave right, either. Right. Um, and I think it had to do with like, you know, assets. If you left, you would take your assets with you. I don't know why. Um, but so in 1985, when the Iran-Iraq war was happening, there was bombs flying everywhere and one landed a couple blocks away from our um, apartment. And so we were just like, you know what, it's time to get out of here. And um, my dad left and said he was going to go give a lecture because he was a pathologist. So he left and stayed with one of his friends in Vienna and left the passports of me and my mom and my sister with the government so that they would, you know, not think we were escaping, basically. But didn't something happen with your dad where they they said uh, he had operated on somebody or he worked with somebody? And Yeah, yeah. So he had um, a technician in his office that he'd saved his eyesight. Right. And so the technician was part of, like, the revolution and told him, like, you saved my eyesight. I'm going to save your life. Like, you're, you know, because he, he, he ran the Shah's hospital. So he basically, they told him to, like, get out quickly. So he sort of got out quickly. <laughs> um, and... Uh, then my mom, my sister, and I escaped um, with uh, smugglers through uh, the desert into Pakistan. Um, and we stayed in Pakistan for three months waiting for visas. And once we got it, we reunited with my father in Vienna, and then we all came to the States together. Sorry, I mean, you say these things quite matter-of-factly. Uh, <laughs> well, there's so many. But, I feel like, you know, but, 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 Persian Jews, like, we all have a very yes, similar story. Yes. Like, but I, I mean, like, for a six-year-old to be smuggled out through the desert in Pakistan. I mean, what can you even tap into the emotions of that time for you? And I mean, I think my mom kind of kept me, you know, even, even when there was bombs flying through the air, and it's interesting now that I look at bombs like in current conflicts, I'm like, oh my God, those were like what we saw, but she would tell me they were fireworks. You know, like let's, you know, the sirens would go off, we'd run to the window in the middle of the night and we'd watch the fireworks. Mm -hmm. Like that's, you know, how they sort of told me. So she didn't actually tell me we were going to America until we crossed the border into Pakistan and we were in kind of like a very makeshift hut kind of restroom, which was basically a hole in the ground um, that you straddled. Um, and if you fell in, you fell in. Um, so she was, you know, we were in this bathroom and that's when she told me, you know, we're going to America because we'd already crossed the border. And my first thought was, oh my God, we're going to meet Michael Jackson <laughs> because there was so many, you know, those bootleg um, thriller videos and like bootleg, like right. whatever, so that you would get at the bazaar. But um, so that was like my first thought. So I was young enough that it was just kind of like a roller coaster through the desert is how it was framed for me. Um, my sister was 13. So, you know, she must have understood a lot more. But, um, you know, I was six and a half. I actually had my birthday um, in uh, Vienna when we arrived there. So I turned seven in Vienna and then we came to the States. You, I mean, when you make it to the States, you don't, unfortunately, I, I don't believe you ever met Michael Jackson, but, uh, nor I do you- I did go to a concert finally. Oh, you did, well, you, <laughs> you made it to the concert, but yeah, you didn't have an easy time of it from what I understand. When, when you got to New York, you were, you were, I mean, you've described yourself as skinny and nerdy. You didn't speak the language. You got teased pretty badly. Mm -hmm. How did, uh, the Dr. Sheila Nazarian that we see now, how did you find yourself and your confidence with that as the backdrop? You know, I think there's a, there's a saying and I don't, I'm sure it's like psychologically based and I've heard it multiple times, but they say your true personality is when you're around three to five years old, like kind of like before the world kind of like slams down on you. Hmm. And so my personality was to get up and, you know, when parents had parties in Iran, I would get up and I would tell jokes, I would stand on a chair and I would kind of like entertain, you know, as a three, four year old. And I think that was my original personality. And I just think it was kind of like finding my way back to that. Hmm. 
and you had a mustache was it like a burt reynolds mustache or what kind of it was the typical persian girl mustache i mean you know it's also like hairy legs like you know you, you my generation your parents wouldn't let you shave your legs because it was like who are you trying to impress you know like so you would sneak sneak to write it and like buy nair and like rub chemicals on yourself instead much better right so um it just was like you know it was like hairy i was super skinny and i mean like super skinny like i would say my elbows and my knees were the fattest part of my extremities um so it was just sort of like people would drop skeletons in my backpack in halloween or when we were learning about anorexia people were like oh like sheila and i was like i'm trying to gain weight you know uh so it was just like a lot of teasing definitely like you know, boys didn't have crushes on me. I had girls um, telling me like, don't raise your hand in class and act smart because, you know, boys don't like that. You know, just like all of this messaging that hopefully is getting a little bit better. Um, do you think that's, uh, I mean, I'm sorry you went through that, but do you think that's helpful now? Oh, I mean, now that, now that I you're glamorous. Stay you're nerdy. G- I don't want you to have a lot of friends. One's enough. Don't get invited to parties. Because I always tell people, like, you don't want to peak in in high school, right? (laughs) You want to kind of suffer a little bit, get that fire. Um, It's very motivating. And you also don't want to, like, be in the circus. You know, I always tell people, I hung out with people that were in the circus, you know, with the boys and, like, drugs and drinking and partying and stuff like that. But I always said, like, I was looking down on them from the nosebleed section. (laughs) So it was kind of like I was aware of those things, but I never, like, got tangled up in it because I was just so super focused. But on, but but but, but Sheila, like it, Sheila, it also gives you an empathy, right? I mean, you're for for people who might look at you and go, "Oh, what does this glamorous Beverly Hills plastic surgeon know about what I'm going through?" You 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 did go through it, right? I did. Yeah, I did, and I mean, I lost my mom when I was 16. You know, she took to breast cancer. So I think there's a lot of like empathy there, and I think the other thing too is you know, coming from Iran and having a lot, you know, my, my dad was very successful as a physician in Iran and then being used to like that good life, but coming here and having nothing and having to like build it up for yourself. Um, I think, and my husband, same thing, you know, so I think we both had high lofty goals, but we both had to really work for it. Um, so, you know, I think, that was like a big connecting thing for us too. Cause I dated guys that were just, they'd be happy like here, but I wanted to be here. Hmm. <laughs> and I think that if they were happy here, they'd be like, what, why, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> I want to get into your ambition, but first of all, I'm mean, just, to, just to complete the story. You become yeah. an economics major at Columbia. Yeah. So where did becoming a, sur- I mean, this is again, the Persian overachiever. <laughs> You're going to think yeah. this is crazy, but yeah. I actually started out as a philosophy major. That is crazy. And on the yeah. first day of um, school, the teacher, I think he was trying to weed people out. And he was like, I don't give A's in this class. I'm like, well, mama has to get into medical school. So mama needs to switch majors. So then I switched to religion and I actually studied um, Islam a lot. I mean, I was, I think I was like one class away from a minor in Islam from Columbia. Um, but yeah. You know, I, I went to that and they were like, oh, it was a lot of writing and math and science were always like, you know, my skills, my skill set, right? Because it was English as a second language, writing, reading comprehension. I always had to read things a bunch of times in order to kind of, you know, get it. So um, went out of that and I said, you know what, where are all the jocks? <laughs> what major are they in? Where can I get, you know, a straight A's, you know, get into medical school, all of that. And that was econ. They were all econ majors. So I actually took an econ class because of that, just to like, you know, dip my, dip my feet in it, you know, see if I liked it. And I actually really liked it. And I never saw myself as like poor, you know, like I was never like very like pushy. I was always like very like, you know, do my own thing. Don't rock the boat, which is like completely the opposite of what I am now. But, um, so I, you know, I was like, okay, let me, let me go in there. Um, and I did really well. And then when I was in, you know, I still had to take all the pre-med classes. That's how Columbia was. Then when I was in between general surgery and plastic surgery, I got the opportunity to get a master's in medical management from Marshall. Right. Um, and I sort of like, and they'd never accepted a resident before. It was kind of, it's business school. You know, you have to work for a while before you get into business school. But I was like the first resident they ever accepted. Um, and it was kind of cool because I was in that class with the like chief medical officer of NASA. It was like a really cool, like think outside the box kind of think tank kind of class with they were all physicians, but they were from like one of them was like running an HMO and another one was like the head of Miller Children's Hospital. And, you know, so it was just kind of like me 
with all of these like huge great minds just talking about business and healthcare and it was just such a cool experience with you know these like awesome people so you could have just been a uh, i'm not just been you could you could be a surgeon you could be a, a a doctor you decide to go into plastic surgery and and back to the conversation we had a few you know half an hour ago where you said everybody told me not to do it no one will marry you when you have kids you're not you're going to stop working it's it's, it's going to be yeah. a disaster how and why did you persist I mean, I was really like, I was really fascinated by science and art. And I always tell people if I didn't get accepted into plastic surgery, I would have gone into like furniture design or something. Mm -hmm. I love building. I like making things with my hands, but I wouldn't like go become a cardiologist. Like that is just, I wouldn't even become a dermatologist. Like it's just not uh, challenging enough for me. It would, I think I would have been bored out of my mind. And honestly, like for all the young people listening out there, a job always becomes just a job. Like you think, Oh, she's a plastic surgeon. That must be so artistic all the time. Like it's no longer that challenging to me to be like completely honest. So it's, it's like, you have to find things outside of your job, no matter how creative your job is to keep you from stagnating. So it's, you know, plastic surgery is like the pinnacle of artistry in medicine, but it's not artistic enough and it's not challenging enough to me in the ways that it used to be. And therefore I, I like, you know, the e-commerce side. I feel like I'm learning a new language mm. or collaborating with hotels to create spas m with my name on it in those hotels. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, I have to keep kind of growing in order to stay challenged and to feel like I'm using my gifts effectively. I mean, you've said that there are so many good plastic surgeons around, um, and you need a, you need to differentiate yourself in the market. What what did it mean to start your own practice to to really start your brand in 2013? I mean, I always tell people like in the beginning when you first start out, nobody knows your name, nobody knows who you are, um, and so instead of like you know wasting your time. Um, kind of i wouldn't say wasting your time instead of spending your time like going out to lunch with the girls or like whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i would always make videos educational videos youtube google owns youtube so i was the only one making videos when i graduated and so whenever you anybody searched anything my videos would come up off of youtube my seo shot through the roof and seo for those of you listening is showing up on the first page of google when somebody searches something right, right. so when i was two years out of residency I was already on the first page of Google when you search Beverly Hills Plastic Surgeon. And just to give you guys an idea, there's 31 plastic surgeons just in my building. Right. So, I mean, it's just sort of like, I was always just um, putting out value, you know, information, um, but also having the wherewithal to know, you know, for example, you never would post a YouTube video to Facebook because Google owns YouTube. So you want to put put like the original MP4, the original video onto Facebook. But do you have any balance in your life? I mean, it sounds like between all of the jobs that I mean, between your your practice and then you know Netflix shows and and e-commerce sites, and then you have three kids. I mean, do you do you have you figured out how to balance this, or are you just like a machine, or how, how do you? Do I that? am. I'm very efficient with my time, and my brain works very efficiently. Um, I always get the analogy of like you know when you're rolling up into like parking uh to and you have to get a ticket you know like if you're going into ralph's parking and you need to get a ticket like as i'm driving in i'm pushing the window down so i barely even have to stop to get the <laughs> ticket so imagine that but like across every second of my life so i get seven to eight hours of sleep every night um you I, get eight I'm hours of sleep every office. night how do you get eight yeah. hours of sleep every night i just do what time I do you mean, go to bed like 10 okay or nine even okay. i'll go to bed right. at nine right. and then I'll, right. I'll work out in the morning um you know take my kids to school do surgery like the other day i'll tell you and i've gotten really fast at surgery so for example on friday i had three surgeries one of them was you know i went in and marked my big surgery while i was waiting for them to take her into the or i did eyelids and botox on someone awake when they took her into the OR, that that surgery used to take me six hours, took me two and a half hours. So I and I had a third surgery at three o'clock. So I had like 
four hours. So I went and I went to Trader Joe's. I came back home, did a load of laundry, <laughs> you know, got dinner prepped and then went back, picked up my daughter, took her to a play date. And then um, on the, you know, after I dropped her off the play date, went back to the office, did my last surgery and then came home. So it's kind of like, um, just like very, I don't know, very efficient. And as I've been working as a surgeon longer and longer, the surgeries become more efficient. I know what to ask for 20 minutes ahead of when I actually need it wow. so that when I'm ready for it, it's already in the room. So it's kind of like a, you know, chess, but like my life is chess. But that's, you're really focused. I mean, not yeah. people, people don't live lives this way. I mean, that this is a very smart planned focused life that also i mean yeah. go, you know going to bed at 9 p.m you're what are you you're still in your 30s that's you know not no, I'm 42 a, all right you're 42 <laughs> that's not everybody wants to do that i mean that's a you know that's part of the sacrifice right you're not hanging out in in you know groovy places in, in at all hours but i or do whatever. like for example i time those so i speak a lot and i get flown out all over to the world to speak um, especially before COVID, haha. But like, for example, I'm going to Cabo this week for a colleague's wedding. So I'll be, you know, parting it up there. Um, and then, you know, next month I was invited to Nashville to speak at a conference. So they, they wine and dine you when you go. Um, you know, after that, I'll be going to Lake Tahoe for a week. So it's kind of like, I'm always on and I'm always available, um, but I do, you know, make time for my family and they've my kids have been like all over the world with me when i'm speaking they've been to copenhagen monaco they've been to prague they've been to paris they've been to london so and next year we were invited to um mazatlan for the mexican uh, society of plastic surgeons so it's kind of like i'll pick and choose these opportunities but i'll bring my kids with me so that they can also experience the world and not feel like oh my mom chose her career over us okay so let so this is a i've been waiting to ask you this question because uh, it, it, I, I actually love asking this question of, of folks like yourself. Uh, I mean, I get the part, I get the piece of proving people wrong. I get that. And I get why that would be so important to you. Uh, but why, why are you so ambitious? I mean, what, think about it for a second. What is all of this about for you? Why are you so interested in growth and pushing yourself so hard? You know, I, I heard, um, uh, you, you had said something like, uh, I, you want to get a million followers on Instagram by the end of the year. Uh, you'll probably do it, but I mean, why, why is that all of that so important? I think, um, I, I just literally went through this whole question myself over the last couple months because I, did, I said like you know I have the house I have the family what, why, why do I do this like what am I doing yeah. and um, I think it comes and I think it changes and then you're really asking like what's your why right so I think it's okay that your why changes like when I first got into plastic surgery my why was to help people one person at a time that's not fulfilling to me anymore and mm. and it's almost like you know if you ask like um a car maker like why do you make cars what's your why they're not going to say my why is making cars <laughs> right it's kind of like the experience or like you know making people feel like they have a second home in their vehicle i don't know what so for me plastic surgery is my job it's not my why um i think at this point it's kind of become um leaving a legacy, touching as many lives as possible, knowing that I have certain gifts and I have a strong purpose. And it's kind of like, how many people can I influence with that, with my gifts? Um, I think the other thing too, that comes along with it is you have to realize your strengths and you have to be able to vocalize them without shame. Like I know that I'm smarter than the average bear and it's very frustrating. And at times it's very isolating. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I just watched Wonder Boy, which, you know, is like the, the head designer for Balmain. And he talked about how getting some fame and having some, you know, big talents can be very isolating. And that resonated with me a lot. It is isolating. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to surround yourself with people that will challenge you. Um, and I find them everywhere. And I think that's part of the reason why I started Think Big, my um Nazarian Institute, our nonprofit, like we had Chris Jenner keynote last year. And it, if I, and I read her book in, in preparation for me interviewing her on stage. And it's like we had parallel lives, like minus the OJ Simpson part and the part where she cheated on her husband. Like we have parallel lives. She lost a parent at 16. I lost a parent at 16. She talks about how she feels like she has to burn the candle at both ends because life is short. And, you know, she also recognizes her gifts. 
you know, she has, she's a very organized mind. She always says like, you know, I'm always evolving. I'm always growing. I'm always this. And I, and I just felt like those kinds of whys and those motivations were very parallel in our lives. But I do think it's a personality type. I mean, I hear you. I'm you, I'm similar to you on the, on, on this, but I do think I, I'm, I disagree with your analogy actually because with the car maker, because I think that there probably is a car maker who really likes the making the cars part. You know, I mean, there are people who just, you know, <laughs> no, you know, for surgeons you know, too, you know, surgeons they, I, too, but I, I'm just I, saying like, for me, the way that I analyze, like people are like, oh, you know, if you ask any doctor in, in high school, why they want to be a doctor, they're, they're going to answer because I want to help people. Right. Well, for me, I want to help the masses now. It's not enough for me to be helping one person at a time. I think it's lovely to do so, but it's just not enough for me. It's not, it's not, I've been doing it for a minute. And so I just need to be, I need more. Okay. So you, I asked you, why are you so ambitious? And your answer was, I'm really ambitious. <laughs> no, it's basically like, it's to leave that legacy and okay, to make okay. as much and to affect as many people as possible okay. during my time here on earth. Okay. I think that's the answer I got to. And it's kind of like, you know, being an inspiration and and that's the way i want to touch people's lives is i want to a make them feel like it's okay to take care of themselves b i think it's okay to want everything as a woman and a man and i think it's showing you know living that example of like i didn't have to sacrifice my family for success in a career right. and vice versa i didn't have to sacrifice my career in order to have an amazing family and great kids who are not like on drugs so it's <laughs> <laughs> and and making them feel loved and having a successful marriage. So I think it's that, but also like, I want to do some cool shit. Like I want to walk runway in Paris fashion week. Like how random is that? I want to, you know, have my like, you know, TV show go, go huge. I want to win that Emmy. Like what, what doctor in residency that you talk to says, you know, what's your goal? You know, junior doctor, they'll be like, I want to win an Emmy. <laughs> like nobody says that. Right. So I feel like the, I'm just getting started and I feel like, anything's possible. And yeah. so I'm, I'm actually like trying to like think big. Maybe it's like politics. Maybe it's, I don't know. Like if you would have told me 10 years ago, I'd be where I am today. I wouldn't believe you. And if I continue the trajectory that's happened in the last 10 years and continue it for the next 10 years, like, holy shit, where are we going to be then? I love it. I love it. Actually, I really, uh, Love that. That that I love the enthusiasm. I love the passion. Listen, I am so grateful for the time you've given us. I before I let you go, I want to ask a just a little bit about identity because we haven't gotten to that yet, and it's really important uh, to me to ask you about it because I know it's important to you too, and and for folks to hear about the it's part of your story. Um, Sheila, tell me tell me about the decision to make it a priority to speak out about racism towards Jews. So, you know, getting out of Iran, and that's why I studied so much Islam in, in, at Columbia, is I just wanted to know why they hated us, you know, because there was a hate there and it's taught from youth. And I think that we have to talk about it. And I had an interview with a gentleman named Kasim who was, you know, raised to hate Jews. And now he actually um, runs the social media for Kufi, which is the Christians United for Israel. And so, you know, I think we need to talk about how from childhood, it's kind of like Jews this, Jews that. If we don't address that, it's kind of like being a doctor. You have to make the correct diagnosis in order to treat it. You can't mm -hmm. pretend it's something else and be PC and not talk about it. We have to talk about it and why, you know, point. 2.2% .2 here, you know, of, of the population on earth, there's only 15 million of us. Why are people so obsessed with hating us? It's crazy. So I think we have to get to like the root cause of why, you know, we're kind of the scapegoat for everything. It's like police brutality, it's Jews fault. Um, this is going wrong with the world, it's the Jews fault. Like we're just 15 million people on earth. Like why, why are you so obsessed with us kind of thing? And when you're, you know, let's say you kill us all off, then who are you going to blame? You know, so I, you know, I went through in Iran and, and when I see the same kind of words being used that were used in the Holocaust or the same silencing that happened in Iran, that's happening here now. Like you can't even say you have an opposing view without being like canceled, which I don't even think is really a thing. I don't know one person who's gotten canceled. I don't know anybody who's gotten canceled, but it's just like this fear, right? And it's sort of like to silence people. How do you silence people? You make them afraid. And that's what happened in Iran. You wouldn't dare because there was like, you know, undercover spies for the revolution that if you said anything bad against the revolution, you'd be dead or you'd get kidnapped. Look at what just happened to, you know, the, the Persian journalist. 
right? Massey, so, yeah. Massey, yeah. You, you, so it's kind of like, for me, seeing those like things starting to happen in the US, it just like in my soul and my gut, if the US goes, there's no safe haven. And I had, and I couldn't sleep with myself at night if I didn't say anything. I feel like you have a double whammy too, as a minority, because you you uh, know what it's like to be Iranian and Jewish. I mean, let's not forget that when you, especially in the '80s, when you first came, uh, Iranians weren't exactly the most popular folks around either, and <laughs> still aren't in, in, in you know yeah. many parts of America. What has your experience been as a Persian Jew? Yeah, you know, I mean, I've been in, you know, sort of this community in Beverly Hills, um, you know, and so I just feel like we sort of stuck together. Like there's a community in Beverly Hills, there's a small community in Atlanta, and then there's a big community in New York. And, you know, so I was kind of like around culturally all the time, Persian Jews, because we all just sort of like, you know, went to live with our aunt who had already moved to an area who's going to help us like get established. So um, it wasn't like, you know, I had that kind of racism then, but then I went to a lot of American schools where I was like one of three Persians. Um, that part wasn't so bad to me, but I just remember feeling like, oh, I wish I was blonde or like, oh, I wish I was white. Right. Um, you know, and I hung out with other minorities all the time, not necessarily Persians, but br other brown and black people just because it was kind of like, oh, we, we get each other. Right. Um, so I didn't really feel it here here uh, as much as I felt it in Iran um, and in Pakistan especially um, but I always felt like I was an outsider for sure you know boys didn't have crushes on us boys had crushes on the blonde girls and and the, like I would put my hair in a ponytail and it would be like all like gross and like the blonde girl would put it back and it would just be like smooth <laughs> you know I remember like thinking of these things and just being like oh you know but I think now it's such an advantage do you know what I mean now it's like I'm, I'm it's a differentiator yeah, we talked about yeah, differentiators yeah. and it's saying like I understand darker skin types as a physician I understand that it doesn't heal the same well I mean I, I, I've got to think Think that people are still discovering you Do, have you heard from iranian jews around the world who i mean find you on netflix and go oh my god you know and yeah, are grateful for I've, no even even iranian muslims in iran that are like help us we love you we love america help us you know like i get messages all the time but i've gotten pretty hateful messages from like anti-semitic persians who maybe live in france which is just known for being totally racist against jews so you know i've gotten the hateful messages um with you know horrible horrible messages that i don't even want to give a platform to these people to repeat it mm -hmm. um, but mostly it's been supportive messages from all iranians of all religions whether they're in iran or outside of iran saying we're proud of you help us you know we you know please do something with your platform to help us it's kind of like what's happening in cuba right now I mean, you know. I Iran isn't a monolith either. There's, it's gone through, you know, different centuries of evolution and 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 morphed into different things over the years. We've we've had people on this program like Homasar Shar, I can think of, or Orly Noy, who've spoken about a time in Iran before the revolution, where as Jews, there were they felt not just comfortable, but there were places like Tehran that were really diverse, uh, yeah. and and Jews had really good standing. Does your has your father talked to you about those times or, or does you know I mean I know about you know I know about those times yeah absolutely but it's just sort of like interesting that this like socialist you know urge comes which sounds great but just doesn't work in practice and now now hearing those same messages here in America you know like take down the capitalism and like but capitalism makes people want to achieve right you know what I mean if we make everything equal there's no more like I don't know. There's no more like want to achieve. There's no more ambition. You kill ambition. So it's kind of like, I think that's why I've been, it's just been so vocal because we've seen this happen before. It's never worked in any country. Right. And it's, you know, we can't let America kind of go down the same road. And you don't want to comparing January 6th, the capital rise to the Holocaust or something, you know, it's a, uh, the, those kind of, uh, uh, there's, there's been analogies that are just a little, what that are unfortunate. Yes. Yeah. And it's just like, it, it, and it just goes back to like such misinformation, like, and with social media, it's just like misinformation is like wildfire. Like yesterday is like, you know, the destruction of the temple. I fasted that, you know, the ninth of Av is like the most sad day in a Jewish history. And, you know, over time, like bad things happen on the ninth of Av, the destruction of both of our temples, all this stuff. So, you know, the Jews went um, to the wailing wall in Israel 
and the the social media is like they attacked the Alaska mosques, and it's like, no, this is what they do every year on this day. Um, and it's just sort of like with, with social media, it's like, and there's only 15 million of us. So it's like, how do we counteract the misinformation? I can be posting all day long about, no, this is actually something that happens every year. There's even a woman with a stroller, like walking, like, is she like with her, with her toddler next to her? You know what I mean? So it's just sort of like, we're kind of outnumbered, but it's just finding allies that are also interested in the truth um and kind of engaging with them to battle this age-old racism um it's just very disheartening but hopefully you know my 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 account and the account of people like me have been kind of a beacon of light to uh, other jews and allies um all over the world i even have supportive messages from palestinians in gaza they're like help us <laughs> we don't like hamas either help us you know <laughs> but if they say anything they're brutalized or they disappear right. for two weeks and then they come back and they're silenced you know right. so those messages unfortunately are not getting out and it has to do with social media it has to do with a narrative that reporters are putting out now it's like reporters aren't actually interested in the truth they're activists they're not there to report the truth they're there to push a narrative and it's just been very frustrating. But that's the same thing, right? That happened kind of in Iran. You're not the first person to make that analogy. Yeah, there's there's times where you sort of think, especially around what we are and are not allowed to say, that uh, it can it, it starts to have echoes of um, repressive uh, uh, places. Um, you know, I, I've been looking forward to this chat, and I and I so appreciate this uh, this interview and and the time you've given us. Let me ask a final question in terms of a global question, based on all that you've experienced and where you're at at this moment. What, I mean, you sort of said something a little earlier, if, uh, you know, in terms of inspiring young people. What what is your message? You know, this program that we do is listened to mostly by Iranians and but around the world, including a lot of folks in Iran. What what is your message to say, a young woman listening to this right now, maybe in Iran, who idolizes you, dreams of accomplishing all, you, all that you've accomplished, what, what do you say to pay it forward? I mean, I don't think they need to idolize me. You know, I think that they should just work to be the best version of themselves. I always say we're all, you know, made in the image of God. We all have, you know, this fire inside of us. It's about kind of silencing the outside noise, really believing in what your unicorn is and what your gift is that God put you on earth to accomplish. And, you know, just sort of having that belief in yourself, even when everybody else is saying, you know, it won't work, it won't work, you can't do this, you're going to be sacrificing this. I mean, I had a Persian woman literally last week come to me and be like, I just feel so bad for you of all the hard work you did. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, but it's just like, it's, are you like that growth mindset or are you just like a comfort mindset? And both are okay, I guess. But it's just, you know, if you have big dreams. Wait a second. Why, why does she feel bad for you? You did hard she work? Just like all the sacrifice you made and all the hard work you put in. It's just like, it was basically like exhausting for her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, wow. I'm a plastic surgeon <laughs> who's like being flown all over the country and nominated for an Emmy and you feel bad for me. But she did. She really in her heart of hearts felt bad. That's quite sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? So it's just like, don't let anyone kind of stop you. And you got to believe in yourself, even when nobody else around you is really believing in you. It's kind of like having that fortitude to push forth. And, you know, we only get one life, right? Mm. So it's like every minute counts and just make the most of your life, um, despite what other people have to say, because most of the time they're speaking from their own blockage. Um, and they don't a lot of times want to see you succeed because it just makes them feel worse about them not achieving been a great pleasure i thank you. thank you so much talk to you again i hope bye-bye i hope so too this was great bye-bye bye thanks dr sheila nazarian award-winning surgeon entrepreneur activist and mother of three she is the host of the emmy nominated netflix series skin decision before and after we reached dr sheila nazarian in los angeles california today back home for Captain Reza and Groovy Shia. Uh, How about Dr. Sheila? I love her. 
I really, I love everything she had to say. The moment she said female cir- cir- <laughs> circumcision, mm-hmm. I was how, like I couldn't stop laughing because this is what I've been saying forever. This is a, this isn't in my personal, personal opinion and solely my opinion. Sorry, to, to, she said that about people getting nose yes, jobs. Yes, that's yes, yes. Right, right, yeah. People getting nose jobs. Not, you're not laughing at female circumcision. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, yeah. no not, well, no, that's obviously yeah, not. Yeah, obviously yeah. not. And that's a tragic thing that does happen in a lot of um, 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 developing countries. And that's sad. But uh, nose job. Nose job and the epidemic of nose job that people of Iranian descent in Iran, outside of Iran, a female, they get it just because they feel like they need it and they really, really don't need it. It's uh, this <laughs> has to. I want to start a campaign. This has to stop. Honest to God, you don't believe that people should get nose jobs. People, even though you no, might no, no. have gotten one, I have not gotten. You claim you didn't job. get one. You claim you didn't. Oh my God, I haven't. Uh-huh. I okay. haven't. It's okay. Yeah, th- th- some people don't like to. I mean, as she was saying, the, you know, even somebody sees her at a party and walks by, they don't want people to know. Allah <laughs> hakat <laughs> You know, if you can, <laughs> like, I quit. This is it. This is my last show. These guys have been accusing me of getting a nose job. They do. Yeah, it looks job. good. It's a good job. It's I a know, whoever it did it is a, a good, good surgeon. Job. God did it. <laughs> <laughs> that right, was right. God's creation. Sure. Okay. All right. But uh, you know what? I lost my <laughs> interest. No, you were in saying that you you don't think people should. You you think I don't that think everybody should get a nose job just because right. your nose is a little big. It's mm. it doesn't mean that you need to get a nose job. It suits your face. Like Jian, you you've got a fairly decent sized nose, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. and you you make fun of it. It yourself, has its own. It's like an industrial uh, uh, oh hydro God. plant. It has like a whole. <laughs> You know, I can say, oh, I never had any work done and stuff and feel good about that. But part of me thinks, man, you know, I don't know if I would have. Maybe I'd feel good if I got a nose job when I was 18, you know? Maybe it would make me happy now. I don't know. But anyway, I mean, beyond nose jobs, I found what she had to say. It was like an extension of what I was saying before the interview about watching the Netflix series and what I said to her, in fact, about this revelation that uh, about how because we we can be dismissive about plastic surgery and put it all in one category of oh somebody's yeah. doing that for ego reasons or to look good on Instagram or something and you know she made she makes the case that there's there's a lot of legitimate reasons for this yeah. albeit um, something that is determined by class and you know whether you have the money and whether you have the ability and you know uh, but uh but if you do it can really change your life i I believe that in some of those cases that she's talking about no i agree i don't disagree with you on that at all and i think this is this totally uh, it it was very informative and um, it changed my opinion on plastic surgery and rhinoplasty nose job and all together but uh it also uh was like uh, affirming my idea of epidemic of nose job mm-hmm. nose job surgery mm-hmm. in Iran and amongst the Iranian community which I think in a lot of cases is unnecessary so m- I don't have a nose job I've never gotten it and imagine this my cousin who's got the exact same nose as me mm-hmm. she went and got a nose job just because she felt like oh it was just a teeny tiny bit right. too big so both of you, you have had nose jobs <laughs> oh my god <laughs> 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 oh, <Shia. laughs> no you know like the only right the now. my problem with the nose job thing is is not people doing what they feel like doing to you know uh, i mean as i say on the in, in the interview i was just saying to her like uh, i know you know uh, how this is uh, change the self-esteem of people to have work done or whatever. If you zoom out and go, an entire you know ethnicity of people, a bunch of like us, feel the necessity to change the way we look. There's something about that that makes mm-hmm. me sad. That yeah. rather than aspiring to look the way we look, yeah. mm-hmm. we aspire to look the way somebody else somebody thinks else is a better does. version yeah, of us, yes. you know, or a different version of us. And it happens to be what you know people in the West or white people have, you know, that and and. So I, I told you, I mean, it's it's such a strange thing around the world. I've told you the story story about going to Vietnam and Cambodia yeah, and yeah. having people That's point at me and, and thinking that they were making fun of me. And it turned out that they were attracted yeah. to having the fact that I have a more prominent nose and that they get surgery to put a bridge in their nose because yeah. they don't like having Compliment. smaller noses. You know, it's this this weird thing about humans wanting what we don't have. Well, you know what was surprising, though, that nobody has taken a photo to her and uh, like a photo, celebrity photo or a model essentially be like I want to look like that yeah. that was quite mm-hmm. shocking to well me. I believe her in terms of her she's obviously a 
believe that she was telling the truth. And just in terms of her practice and what you know what she's interested in doing, that there's other people that will do you know certain things for other reasons, for money, whatever. Um, but I found that weird too. Like, really, no one is coming. No and the, here's a picture of Charlize Theron. Can I look like <laughs> yeah, that? You know? Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, maybe. I, maybe uh, nobody has. I guess. You know. Uh, it's interesting for me that uh, Dr. Nazarian and uh, mostly all successful people, they extended their daily life. I mean, th- she lives as uh, her day is 40, 48 hours. You know, mine. Yeah. Is and yeah, <laughs> she's got so much going on. Yes, and, it's and really three kids. That's crazy. <laughs> the great mother. I mean, who, what? Are, yeah, it's yes, incredible. Yes, it's really interesting. You can tell. You can tell yeah. she's got. You know, she's multitasking. Yeah. She's got a bunch a going on. She's quick. I mean, it, yeah, it's it's. Um, yeah. getting all, all that done. She doesn't seem tired, but um, good for her. And um, her story is a remarkable one. Oh, her personal yes. story. That's part of the the validation of, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a person coming on the show uh, next week, uh, Ali Parsa, mm-hmm. who's this billionaire, British uh, Iranian billionaire, and, and and he he left Iran as a refugee by himself. Oh. You know, same thing I think through Pakistan that she was talking about with her yes. family, uh, and these stories are are riveting to see where the person has gotten to. You know, yes. based on where they were. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, listen, it is. Um, we haven't had we haven't done letters of the week this week, and so we're going to do it. Even though it's a Thursday, we've got we're going to do our letters of the week segment, so we can crown something the letter of the week. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier in the show, we're, obviously we're missing Keon. She's off on her um, birthday uh, week down south, uh, having a, a pina colada right now somewhere <laughs> on a beach. Um, but in her stead. Uh, for this uh, you know, one time only, or you know, we'll we'll see. I mean, maybe you know, super P, <laughs> super at everything. That uh, we have Parry saw super P from our team uh, is coming to the studio and is going to help us out with letters. Yes, yes. Hello, Hello the Shanta. Mashat kid yeah. just came from Mashat three three months ago. Was listening to Rook all that time when you were in Iran, and now you here you are in the Rook studio. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> good to have you here, and, and ha- really good to have you in Canada. Thank you. I'm happy here. Okay, so you've helped to um, put together some letters that we're going to read for about Khuzestan. Let's go. This is what we do. We do the theme, right? Mm. All right. Okay. Let's hear it. Go for it. And then we do this. Uh, yeah. See. Super P is too cool for that. She, <laughs> yeah, she, she intentionally, lie. yeah, that, 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 that not biting. Lie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on Monday, we had a special edition of Rook dealing with the terrible human rights and environmental crisis happening in Iran, and uh, in particular in the southwest region. The episode was called "Explaining Khuzestan," and we featured scientist and writer Kaveh Madani and journalist and former Kahan editor Amir Tahiri. We've had so much response to this episode, and the, and the comments and letters are still coming in. If you have not checked it out, please check out that episode, number 130, the last uh, episode of Rook. Uh, and you can always email us at info at rookmedia.com or post on any of our platforms. So, Super P, you've got the first letter. Yes, Who's I have. it from? Um, Nassim Valim wrote to us, such an informative interview. Enjoyed every second of this episode. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Nassim Valim. Um, by the way, you do uh, Super B does the translations for. Yeah. She did the the Farsi and Reese the subtitles oh, on yes. the Kave Madani's episode. So, what would Nassim Valim? Uh, what would uh, she be saying in Farsi if you translated that sentence? You see? Yeah. See, Super P speaks Farsi and English better than yes. Reza. <laughs> and Kian. <laughs> and, well, that's, yeah, and me. <laughs> uh, we had one from Ta- uh, Tanoz Osefi, who also wrote on Instagram. Uh, Thank you, Rook team, for this. Listen, learn, and find a glimmer of hope. Khuzestan has been so heavy on my heart. We have a letter from fire.a.f where it to us, thank you, Rick team. This episode was truly needed these days. South of Iran was one of the last places I visited before leaving Iran and the situation of people where it makes my heart melt. 
At the same time, I am afraid the other parts of Iran, like Mazandaran, will face water bankruptcy in near future. Keep up the good work. All right. Nice. Wow, Thank you. Down, huh? I, I like your voice, Sufi. It's very soothing, oh. and yeah, it's very good. Thank you, Shaijun. <laughs> Uh, and this from Sammy uh, underscore Cheers. Sammy Cheers says, Mr. Gomeshi. Well, thank you, Sammy. Uh, an excellent interview with Kaveh Madani. It is much needed dialogue that's going to concern us no matter where we live. Iran is an unusually complex place. And having academics such as Mr. Madani, who has been on both sides of the equation, may help us deal with a rather gloomy future. Uh, and lastly, we may have lost you in CBC, but having you on Rook is a wonderful silver lining. I'm happy to be doing Rook. Sammy, thank you for that letter. Who's next? We have a letter from Kurosh K. Or Kurosh of the Sky. Uh, he wrote, great job for having Mr. Tahiri on. He's a treasure trove of knowledge and first-hand historical anecdotes. Would love to see you secure more interviews with him. Jian, keep up the good work, Dadash. Dadash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that you, you that was in the letter, right? Yeah, you, you're, you're, it you're, was. You're not calling me. Donald no. Trump. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we should get. Uh, I want to actually speak to Amir Tahiri about K Han, the oh, history of K Han. That would yeah. be a really interesting one. This one from Setare, who says, "Hey, thanks for sharing, but I disagree with Kave Madani. The government's mismanagement started post-revolution." and is attributed to their ridiculous religious and political views. It's not that complex to understand. As you remember, Kaveh Madani said this is very complex and it goes back generations. Uh, Setare says Lake Ermia is another lake in Iran that experienced similar issues. Following the 1979 revolution, the Islamic Republic adopted a policy of food self-sufficiency in part to shield its new Islamist authorities from international pressure. Out went many of the lakeside vineyards, some of which were uprooted for religious reasons. In came thirstier produce such as apples and sugar beet, a similar story to that of our beautiful Karun River. As for the dams, several papers were written by environmentalists in Iran opposing the building of dams, warning the government not to move forward with this. Suffice to say, these environmentalists had their employment terminated by government officials, and many fled the country, if not were imprisoned. That's the Islamic Republic for you. If you speak up, they silence you. No living thing is safe while the Islamic Republic is in power. It's that plain and simple. Satara making... Uh, Yes. Her view is very uh, clearly known. What uh, What do you have next there? I have a Steve uh, Sohonaki. He wrote, awesome discussions, both guests. Thank you for posting. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Super P. And we have the letter of the week. Woo! Oh. You have to clap here, Super P. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, this letter is from Parsumash. Yeah, she has written to us before, I think. Is Parsumash she? I think so. I guess it so. Was, yeah, um, it was she. Yeah. Parsumash. We. How do we know? Uh, I, I. I have I, no idea. No, I do. I remember it was a she because when I heard the name the first time, Kian read it, and he, she said it made an impression. Like All I right. was like, wow, I never heard that name before. So Parsumash says, hello, Rook. Long time no chat. So Parsumash has written oh, to yeah. us before. Thank you for this very important program on Khuzestan. I remember the last time I left a comment, I mentioned that I was from Masjid Soleiman, Khuzestan, mm. the first city in the Middle East that where oil was discovered. I want you to know that my username, Parsumash, is the original Persian name of Masjid Soleiman, known as... Uh, as the city of firsts in Iran. Wow. Did you know that, Shaya? No. Isn't that Par interesting? No really idea. interesting. Parsumash. Parsumash. Interesting. Yes. Parsumash, thank you for that. You have the letter of the week. Super P, thank you for sitting in. We're so happy to have you here at thank part you so of our much. team. And uh, Groovy Shaya, Merci Captain Reza. Merci <laughs> Dalash to you too. Uh, this is full time for Rook for today. Remember, for all things you want to see and hear about Rook, all of our episodes, all of our former guests, all of our Rook moments, 
check out our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, where you can also become a patron of our program. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together, the fabulous Keon, Super Patty Saw, Thoughtful Nagin, Aponsa the Artist, Producer Susan, Savvy Roham, Sponsorship Sean, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, and Aray Merdad. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. It's free on any of our platforms. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. In the meantime, have a good weekend. See you Monday. And Mizu Mashi. Mizu Mashi.